Today we're going to look at part two of a message that we started last week. Uh, this was just going to be a two-part series, but I think it's going to end up being three parts. Uh, so I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. If you didn't hear the, if you didn't hear the first part, um, I think it's available online. We've been thinking together about the future of the church and how the shift in our culture, we talked about it as a change of environment, has affected uh, the body of Christ um, in, in Canada. It's no secret that the church is uh, shrinking. Um, and in many places, uh, the church is actually shutting down. Uh, they're closing, closing the doors. They're no longer a, a community to support um, that local church anymore. Um, we no longer live in a culture that supports um, all of this, buildings and pastors and congregations. We no longer live in that uh, culture anymore. Now, back in the day, did everyone attend church? Well, no, they didn't. Uh, but the m most people acknowledged the the place that the the church held in society whether that church was protestant or whether it was catholic or whether it's orthodox most people said there was a place for the church uh, in canada and seen the the effect of the church um, in our nation uh, did everyone believe the story that the bible tells no people didn't not everyone did but again there was this acknowledgement that the the book the bible had actually shaped our um, nation and spoke to its morals and what it should be, uh, how it should should live. There was this common consensus about uh, about life and how one uh, should live, and that was rooted in a Judeo-Christian understanding of morality. Uh, th it was recognized that there were societal benefits to following the golden rule and keeping the Ten Commandments, all those things, even if people. Uh, didn't necessarily uh, believe it or, or follow it. Uh, some of you remember in your junior and secondary school days uh, by reciting the Lord's Prayer, right? Who, who did that? Yeah, pretty much all of us. From my experience, I said the Lord's Prayer um, right up until I left high school. That was a long time ago. But you have to ask, don't you? Like, why in the world... Would we start the, a public school day? Public school. That's for everybody. Public school day. Praying to a Christian God in a way prescribed to us by Jesus, the, who claimed to be the Son of God, unless, unless it was Christian soil that the Canadian nation was birthed in, right? Why in the world were we doing that? Nowhere else are they doing that. But that reality doesn't exist anymore. In fact, it's scarcely acknowledged to ever have existed. If you talk to young people, they wouldn't even get that that was part of our history. We use the picture of a jungle and a desert as a, as a way of describing these two realities. In the jungle, there is a richness of diversity and life forms. And yes, there are challenges in the jungle, but there are plenty of resources to thrive. And that's exactly the, the frontier that Canada was. And it is the, the situation in which the church grew up in Canada. And yes, the church did thrive in Canada for a number of years, didn't it? You were part of that thriving. Uh, year, stories are told of Grace Church where they almost had 200 people in Sunday school. Imagine that. That's just Grace Churches. That's true of so many places. Church was thriving. But those days are gone. You know that. It seems like the jungle has swallowed, been swallowed up by the desert. That's the other picture, the jungle and the desert. If you look around at the landscape that is Canada, yes, there are remnants of a thriving church. In fact, there's almost a church on every corner in every small town, isn't there? There's almost a church on every small, in every corner. There are signs that it was once here. Someone has called this vestigial Christianity, vestiges 
of a Christian past, but that's becoming less and less. We're truly living in a Judges 2.10 situation. After that generation had been gathered to the Lord, once that one generation had died, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done in Israel. An entire generation has grown up within Canada and they do not know the Lord. They do not know what the God of Israel, who the God of Israel even is, let alone what the God of Jesus has done on the cross and resurrection, what Jesus has done in the nations of the world, what Jesus has done in this place and on this soil. To stay with that picture, that metaphor of jungle and desert, you could say that we are, that because of the massive changes in Canadian culture, we are now living in a different ecosystem. We are living in a deep, different ecosystem. And I think what we need to do as a church is to agree, and actually this is the goal of this little mini-series that we're doing here at the beginning of, of, um, of this ministry season. I think really what we need to do as a church is to agree that we can't keep our jungle ways in the midst of a desert culture. I don't see too many head nodding, but... I think we, because this ecosystem has changed, the culture has changed, we can't keep our jungle ways in the midst of a desert culture. Because if we are living in a different ecosystem, that means that we must adapt to a different ecosystem. You can't live like you do in the jungle, like you do in the desert. You won't survive. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Churches not surviving. And I want you to let that sink in. Because we can't keep doing what we're doing and expect different results. Someone has said that's a good definition for insanity. To keep doing what you're doing expecting different results. I'll say it again. We can't keep our jungle ways in the midst of a desert culture. So we considered uh, three paths to uh, revitalization. And I'm only rehearsing these because I think we need to get these categories in our heads and agree that what's going to take us forward and what's, what's going to be helpful and what's not going to be helpful. We agreed last week that uh, re-engineering uh, doesn't work. Doing more of what we've always been doing only better will not take us forward. The culture has moved on. It's changed. We've said this. Uh, we also need to uh, readjust. And when I say readjust, don't get to mean we're going to change our theology. Jesus is Lord and always will be Lord. And we'll always preach Jesus is Lord. We'll always preach that you must be born again. We'll always preach that there's a heaven and there's a hell. We'll always preach that God expects us a, 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 um, a, a way of living that is pleasing to him. We're not changing that. But we could change some things to make it possible to reach people. So re-engineering, simply moving around the deck chairs on the Titanic doesn't help us. Revival is always a possibility. And the truth is that we cannot do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? We cannot do anything without the enlivening, empowering of the Spirit of God in our lives. And that's why I think today is the day that we need to receive a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit so that we're empowered for witness. It's, if there was a day that we needed it, it's today. We're living in a different time. And we need a different level of power for witness and for right living. We have to believe that. So revival is not off the table. We're calling on God and we'll continue to call on God to do what we cannot do which is to prepare the soil of our community to receive the gospel and prepare us to be those seeds in our community 
We absolutely need the Holy Spirit's power. So that's not off the table. But it's not the only answer. Last week we said that we must also proceed with remissioning the church. And what it means to remission is what we need to discover going forward. It's awakening that commission that we've been given to by the Lord, the commission to make disciples through our faithful witness. The Great Commission. This is the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of this age. I believe that this is the end of the age. That's our mandate. That's our calling. Pastor Nana and I had a conversation with uh, a couple uh, Christian leaders this week. And this one Christian leader said that she, uh, up until two years ago, and she's been a churchgoer for most of her life, she said up until two years ago, she'd never even heard of the Great Commission. And so I don't want you to ever say that, that you'd never heard of the Great Commission. This is the Great Commission. This is what we're meant to do. Go and make disciples as you go, and when you go, and how you go. Wherever you go, we're making disciples. The Great Commandment is to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. The Great Commission is to make disciples who make disciples. That's why Christ came, after all. That's why Christ came to the earth. The Apostle Paul tells young Timothy, a young pastor in the faith, he says this, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why Christ came, to save sinners. And we have to take this as, in our, as, a, as, a, as a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That means that everyone should believe this. As a Christian, completely and without reservation, believe what? That the point of Christ's coming into the world was to save people. Are we saving people? No. People are going on their way without any Christian witness in their lives. You see, it's not good enough that we're saved. It's not even good enough that our loved ones are saved. Christ came for all people. All people. Everywhere. No matter what their background. Christ came for them. I'm praying for myself and I'm praying for you that the Spirit of Jesus would give us a renewed passion for souls. And maybe you have a passion for souls, but that passion for souls would go deeper and deeper and cause us and compel us toward action. A passion for souls. Most, most people in the church today are acting like God uh, is, only inter- is calling us to, to preserve all of this. Sunday morning, in a building we call our own, with programs that we have designed. But that's not the case, friends. I mean, I'm thankful for this, aren't you? We're certainly thankful for this, and we want to keep this, and keep doing this. But that's not the mission of the church, to preserve itself. We are not in the self-preservation business. You know this next scripture. Everyone knows the scripture. For God so loved the world. What did he do? He gave. His one and only son that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The giving is the action of God. Giving. Not keeping or hoarding or maintaining or preserving. It's giving. It's not self-preservation that should characterize the people of God, but self-donation. We need to give ourselves for the sake of this community. Christ was given for the sake of this world, his church, and his body can do no less. We do not exist for ourselves. We exist as a church 
for the sake of the world, for the sake of Port Hope and the surrounding areas, because this is exactly where God has placed us. You were born here or you moved here and God relocated you here because you're part of the salvation of this community. The church doesn't have a mission as much as the mission has a church. Mission is priority. Mission is priority. When we lose that, when we lose mission as the priority, what happens? We end up arguing about the color of the carpet. Preoccupied with ourselves. Inwardly focused. Devouring each other and all the silly little squabbles that churches get in that cause them to split or to shut down. That's not the mission of the church. That's self-interested. That's self-involved. And in light of what Christ has done, it's selfish behavior. The Canadian church, our church, doesn't need to close, but it does need to die. The Canadian church, our church, doesn't have to close, but it does have to die. Again, Jesus' words, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Dying is the way forward. A number of years ago, I had a connection with a, a pastor from uh, Montreal. And he was the pastor of a thriving church. This church, uh, they had taken over a, an abandoned Catholic cathedral in downtown Montreal and in a neglected part of the city. And the church brought newness and revival to the center of that city. It's a tremendous, tremendous story. But that's not where he started in the ministry. We happened to be in Winnipeg at the same time together, and so I sat down with him. We had an opportunity, I had an opportunity to hear his story one night. And he actually started his ministry in an Italian Pentecostal church in Montreal, which back in the day, like all churches, were thriving, was doing well when he took over being the pastor. But as the na na neighborhood changed, as people moved in and people moved out, as the neighborhood changed, the more the neighborhood changed, the more the church stayed the same. And it became smaller and smaller. And this pastor could see the writing on the wall, but the people couldn't. They were a proud Italian Pentecostal church. And they had been through a lot, and they were going to survive this. They circled the wagons, and they looked inwardly, and they said they would be fine. And the more he tried to cause them to embrace change, the more they committed to, we've never done it that way before. And as much as he wanted to stay, and as much as they wanted him to say, he's a really good pastor. He ended up leaving that congregation and planting a church that he'd pastored when I, when I met him. And as he summed up this whole process of leaving one church and starting another, which was very challenging for him because he loved his people. He was himself Italian. And he, he grew up within that community and he loved that church and he loved those people. But he said this to me, uh, that really what he had learned through this whole process, this is what he said to me, and it has stuck with me ever since. It's simple, but so profound. He said this, the church will either die or it will die. It will die or it will die, meaning that it will die, which is to say that it will grow old and eventually close the doors. Or it will die, meaning it will put aside its personal agenda and take up God's agenda. Jesus said the exact same thing. 
If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. For me. That's Christ's program for our lives. That's Christ's program for the life of this community. It's his agenda, his desire, his plans he came into the world to save sinners. That's why he's here. And truly, if our only option for church is on a 10.30 on a Sunday morning, then we're in trouble. As I said last week, it's not that we're in trouble because we can probably ride it out for the next 10 years or 20 years maybe, possibly, possibly, if you're all good and hang around and I hang around. We can probably make it work. But where will the witness be past that should the Lord tarry? What about your grandkids and your kids and all those other thousands of people that make this area their home? Where will be the witness then? Now, the kingdom's never in trouble. Amen? The kingdom's never in trouble. But this way of doing church is... Now, if this troubles you, and it probably should, if this troubles you and it seems daunting and it leaves you confused and even anger, I understand that. I get that. I would rather just keep going like we're going. But death is not for the faint of heart. Death is not for the faint of heart. The truth is, we have never faced this situation before in the history of our church and in Canada. We are in uncharted territories, but how many know the Lord can lead in those dark places? And if you're upset by that and this, let's recognize that. Let's acknowledge that. Grieve if you need to, and many of you will need to grieve this passing of this. But let's do it with the knowledge that we serve a God who raises the dead. Let's do it with the knowledge that, that God is in this, in, specializes in making all things new. Let's do it knowing that God is the one who can give back the years the locusts have eaten. That he's the God who is not willing that any perish. And he's the God who hears and answers prayer. Hallelujah. If my people who, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. How many know that God can heal Canada? And can heal this land, Northumberland County. He can do it. God can, can God revive the church? Of course he can. Can God make dry bones live? Of course he can. Can he fill us with a spirit and empower a bold witness? Of course he can. Can he set the captive free and heal the sick and turn the sinner into saints? Of course he can. Can he make his name known from sea to signing sea? Of course he can. There is a path to revitalization. But it won't be t tinkering with the inherited church. This is the inherited church. It will come through restructuring the local church for mission. For mission. That we exist for mission. What might that look like? This restructuring for a local, for, uh, for, of a local church for mission. What might that look like? Well, God is the most creative being imaginable, so I suppose it could look like anything. But the picture that we, uh, we have been thinking together about, uh, Pastor Donna and I, I might as well get her in trouble too, is this idea of, back to our title of our series, Deep Roots and Wild Branches. Next week we'll talk more about this, but Deep Roots and Wild Branches. Just think for a moment that the inherited church, 
all this, and I'm not criticizing the inherited church, it represents the deep roots. Because God's not done with this, is he? God's not done with this. And he's not done with us as a way of being church. There's great, there's great treasures of wisdom and practices in the inherited church. How many of you are blessed by going to church? I don't always like going to church. I don't always like going to church, even as a pastor. And there was a time in my Christian life where I didn't go to church for a good chunk of time. But I know after all those weeks of, and months, actually, of not being in church, I was dying inside. You need a community. I love the church, and I love being together with God's people who wherever they are, and I've visited churches in other parts of the world, and there the Spirit of God is also, and there is a word of encouragement to all of us everywhere. We need the church. I love the church. The gathered church gathers together in, in an opportunity to glorify God in corporate worship. It comes to the table and receives nourishment from the Lord. It baptizes people. All this stuff is part of the inherited church, and it's wonderful. All the songs that we sing, new ones and old ones, they're treasured possessions and we should thank God for them. I'm glad for this. If you think I'm away with this, I'm not. It's so important. And in a, but in a church culture, all this made sense, but we don't live in a church culture anymore. In our current ecosystem, we need a new form of church a new way of being church, a fresh expression of church. And that's where the wild branches come in. Have you ever been under the canopy of a, a large tree? And around that large tree, you'll see around the perimeter, these little small saplings, right? Little saplings all around the, the base of that tree. Those little saplings are the wild Branches that have been seeded from the big tree, right? And the branches have a chance to grow because they receive the benefit of being in proximity to the mature tree. There's shade, there's protection, there's resources, and there's actually care because they're, in so, they're so close to the main tree. And this is the, this is the image that we're working with, or the metaphor that we're working with. This is the way of revitalizing existing congregations in communities. We want to keep the inherited church, but we also want to be working on some wild branches and growing different expressions, fresh expressions of the church to give birth to new life. And as we give birth to new life in our community and new expressions of church in our community, it will, all, it will come back to give life to this community. Amen. It will. It will work that way. It will be reciprocal. So there's the gathered church, which is you and I, but there's also the scattered church, but they're tethered together. Some people talk about church planting as an as a, uh, either or. You either are planting a new church or you're part of an existing church. Well, why can't we have both? Why can't we have both? Why can't it be a both and an and situation where there's the inherited church and then an emerging church? Now you say, Jeff, what would that look like? I have no idea. I'm the first one to say I'm the most ignorant man up here today. Person in this room, I'm the most ignorant one. I have no idea. Again, we're in a new place. But if a God is in this, how many believe that he will show us? He will show us those people, those groups of people, those people of peace in our community that are actually hunger, hungering right now for a spiritual reality that only Jesus brings. But it may not look like this. It may, look, it may be in a tattoo parlor. It may be at a McDonald's. It may be at a dog park. I don't know. But it'll be something. A fresh expression, a wild branch, tethered to this inherited place. God will show us in fact, I think we need to choose to believe that he's already putting it together already. He's already working on it. 
Because the kingdom is bigger than the church. And God is already making it, making provisions for this. And again, I don't know what it will look like, and I don't know where he will lead me, but I'm happy to follow in this season. And I hope you are too. If we seek him with all our faith, and if we reorder our lives toward mission, I know that we can discover it. I know that God will show us what it is. If we will restructure for mission, and again, I don't even know what that looks like. If we will restructure for mission, I know that he is faithful to bless that endeavor because the God we serve is not willing that any perish. Any perish. Well, you'll have to come back for part three. <laughs>